welcome to the show. Thanks, Nasus. Excited to be here. Very, very excited to have you on for this first episode of uh, Scaling Ambition and looking forward to diving into a bunch of topics from your experience finding a co-founder, hiring and all the issues around that, which we were discussing before you've had some potential issues with and a lot of learnings from, um, and the fundraising process as well, which is also very relevant for you at the moment. But to start off with, tell me a little bit, a little bit about how you dived into entrepreneurship. What was the path that led you to building your own company? Sure. So uh, my path to entrepreneurship is very strongly linked to my relationship with my co-founder, Suryansh. Uh, we used to work together for five years. Uh, we attended the same school as well. And uh, a lot of it related to conversations we were having together at the last few years at our previous job, where the conversations focused on our frustration with being able to do what we thought was relevant and what we thought was something we could really contribute to and have a voice in. And there are not many ways uh, to feel, to get that satisfaction from work. Uh, you know, I, I, we had a really satisfying career for five years, but then, you know, that five year itch comes along. And we both had this moment to decide where we both got PhD offers. And we're like, are we going to do this and go back into academics for five more years? But there's this other thing on the table. Uh, startups or wh whatever you want to call it where we can do our own thing and see where it goes and uh, you know it was it was, so it was very strongly linked to this idea that we wanted to have a voice mm. for, and a creative outlet and feel that we were doing something worth our time that we strongly believed in and you know at, at, that, at that time and I still believe the same you know the, the startup route or the entrepreneurship route felt like the, the way to go that you know th this would be the right thing to do to, to to achieve that feeling. Mm, so plenty of people listening will have come from an academic background and maybe considering doing PhDs or doing PhDs. What would you say to them based on your experience in terms of the thoughts that were going through your mind, your perceptions of the risk involved with this career path? What were you thinking? What would you say to those people? Sure. So obviously there's a lot more risk taking on an entrepreneurship pathway versus an academic PhD path. However, uh, you have a lot more agency in the entrepreneurship pathway you know you are a master of your own fate right uh, and you wake up every day you have to decide what you're going to do that day and especially you know in those early days of starting when it's just you and your co-founder or you alone or however you find yourself in, what, in that situation and it's basically you have to dictate what's going to happen that day that week and obviously that work also dictates the chances of your success so I think if you're um, attracted to this idea that you, you're looking for that agency, you're looking for that ability to dictate the next couple of years of your life uh, as your career, um, entrepreneurship has been a very, very attractive uh, um, career path for me in that sense. And it's definitely been very, very fulfilling. It has its ups and downs, but generally, uh, you know, no regrets. It's, 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 you get to do what you want to do. Uh, you have to face up to certain things that happen in response to certain things that happen. But in the end of the day, you get to go home and say, you know, I decided to do this today and that worked out or it didn't work out. That's on me. You know, I can improve it this way. Mm, for sure. So tell me a little bit about your relationship with your co-founder, Surian. So you mentioned it was sort of a, a longer time co-founding relationship, which is not usually common for EF. So mm -hmm. talk to me about how you guys knew each other from before and the story about how you kind of applied to EF. Sure. So I, I knew Suri Ansh through, uh, we used to work together at a practice called Zahadid Architects here in London. It, it's, for the lack of a better term, a cutting edge architecture practice known for very non-standard geometries in architecture. So if you've been to the Serpentine Gallery in Hyde Park or the Aquatic Stadium in London for the Olympics, those were projects that were put out from that office. And we worked in the research division in that company so a fairly small team in a fairly large office very close-knit team uh, we shared ideals we shared motivations uh, we shared what we thought was interesting mm -hmm. and you know that was the driving force of five years of i believe great work in that team and uh you know through that experience we, all of us got quite close and we would have a lot of conversations and more and more these days in architecture, cutting edge architecture, the conversation more often than not switches over to technology. Mm. Uh, what is the role of technology in design? Uh, you know, it, it, 
we had a clear opinion back then that um, technology is the kind of dominant force in society these days. And if we wanted to engage on that level, you had to kind of engage with technology. Mm -hmm. And that's like I was talking about earlier when we decided to, uh, you know, maybe we should start our own company. We didn't think of it as a startup or a technology company or anything like that. We at the time we were heavily interested in robotics and machine learning. Uh, specifically, my co-founder was uh, Suryansh was exploring 3D printing robots, and I was exploring uh, the design of software for robots, you know, relative to designing interfaces for them or uh, using certain things in machine vision to augment them. And we're like, yeah, this this sounds like it could work. Let, let's see what where it goes. And uh, four months after leaving our jobs and deciding to set up shop, we got to a point where like, okay, we have this really interesting prototype and it does what we say it does but i have no idea how to build a business around this right in the end of the day that's what needed to happen and that's when we started to look around and had a few meetings one of which was with ef actually with matt mm. uh, and i remember i went to that meeting alone and i went back to Suryansh and very distinctly telling him like that was one of the first meetings where i felt like someone got what we're trying to do Right, because we didn't have a lot of meetings back then. We were we took a couple of meetings, but you know Matt engaged us on our technological level and was, he clearly had done some research or knew about the space. So it was that level of engaging conversation I could have with my co-founder with mm -hmm. someone else. And I'm like, okay, maybe this is the place for us. And at the time, EF was starting to put out a, a good amount of businesses, and we could see by meeting more people in the team at EF that, okay, these guys could help us do what we need to do, which is take this prototype and this technology we're interested, put a business idea around it, turn this thing into a company that could potentially work out. And uh, like I was saying, the thing that sealed the deal for us wa was uh, the ability, wh when we spoke to Matt and Alice in that time, people like Savs, uh, we really felt like these people were engaging us on the level we felt was really interesting and we could talk like uh, like we talked to each other mm -hmm. and they had that extra level of experience that we lacked. And, and that's what essentially sealed the deal for us to join EF. Mm, so talk to me about this piece of building a business around the idea and the expertise that you guys had. What was What was the biggest challenge you had starting out with? So the biggest challenge that we had was non-technically so we had a bunch of technical issues uh, you know how to build the robot how to th how to feasibly 3d print uh, a realistic and robust robot in this case an industrial arm but you know the question that ef came with pretty quickly and w was very to this day is an interesting question to us is like who's this for mm. you know who wants this product who's going to buy this product uh, how does this turn into an actual uh, business and how does that, once you, once you know who this is for, your product will improve that, you know, that was probably conversation number two with EF. And I would say we still have that conversation internal to the company today, week in and week out. Uh, you know, this, um, back then we didn't know this terminology, right? But product market fit or however you want to refer to it mm -hmm. was essentially the core of that question, right? Like, who is this for? Who are you designing? Are you designing it for people like yourselves? So makers and hobbyists who are frustrated with the state of the robotics field and want to improve? Or is this for people who use robotics day in and day out to produce value in their businesses? And there was this really exciting period of time around the end of EF where there was a lot of churn in our minds regarding are we going to go to Kickstarter and just push this out to the maker community and see who bites? Or are we going to take some more time and go out to the market and see who really wants it and start to collect user information? Mm. And we ended up going the second route. And, you know, in two months, I, I lived in the UK at that point for seven years. And in those two months, I saw more of the UK than I did my whole life because we just went out to tons of industrial towns, mm -hmm. tons of factories, taking this robot and just putting it in front of people who make things for a living. And like, what do you think? You know, do you want this? And slowly through that kind of outreach, uh, some serendipity, which is us getting published in a few websites, we had this explosion of interest and we put up a survey on our website and that survey is now, you know, around eight, 9,000 people have filled out that survey over the last year and a half. 
two years, and it clearly showed us who wants this product. Right? We were quite surprised that there was a ton of interest from the fields of manufacturing mm. that w really wanted the concept of a flexible and affordable robotic solution. Um, so if, to a big extent, you know, a lot of that discussion boiled down to, in one way or another, to that conversation, which was, who's this for? Mm. And I think if we hadn't asked that question critically, we would have made some interesting slash possibly wrong decisions at the time because this, I think uh, someone told me this thing once, I, it might have been Wendy, about you know you identify with people like you and that's good sometimes. This will come back up in the hiring conversation, mm -hmm. uh, but it's bad sometimes. And we definitely, at the in the first few months when it was just me and, and Suryansh in a room building robots, we were definitely just identifying with people like us. When I, no one outside of who we are and how we think would want this product. Mm. And it's being nudged to ask a different question, which is no, go out and prove that or disprove that, that allowed us to be like, oh, wow, there's a bunch of people out there who are parts of small and medium manufacturers, large Fortune 500 manufacturers, super, like company, worldwide electronics manufacturers who want this. Mm. And I'm not going to sell you the dream then that everything took off from then and we were selling tons of robots, but actually it changed a lot of our mindset because you were then like, A, why do they want that? Because they can afford the better solution, so why do they want, or the, I don't want to use the word better, they can afford the more expensive solution, so why do they want ours? And B, what do we need to do to our solution to meet their vision of what, what they saw when we first pitched, right? Mm -hmm. So to them so that you know that was a very um, and still is exciting conversation in the company and how we develop our product for sure so as we were walking up the stairs to come into l block just now you're telling me you're in the process of finishing up a funding round um and it's your second one so tell me to start off with what's the number one mistake that you think most founders make in the fundraising process what, what would you advise people not to do so, um, I, I think there's the common wisdom uh, of, you know, never raise when you need to raise. Um, I, I would say that's definitely in our experience true. Mm -hmm. But again, if in the context of r coming out of EF, you need to raise, right? Especially in the b back in those days, there wasn't a convertible note coming out of EF. So it was sink or swim, right? Uh, and so a lot of your efforts and your co-founders' efforts go into the fundraise process. I would say specifically a mistake we made um, or, or something that we might have tweaked a bit if we had to go back mm -hmm. was a, a lot of our efforts in that first round were focused on only the fundraising, right? So the, the company progressed. We were going out to a lot of these site visits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, I would say there could have been a more streamlined process between fundraising and company building. Uh, again, some people just don't have that luxury because if you're at rock bottom, you need you need funds to move on. Uh, you know, we, we had this investor tell us something recently that we, me and Suryansh have come to identify with very strongly as a piece of advice, which is, uh, you know, meet for advice, get money. Uh, meet for money, you're gonna get advice, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think we, between me and him, we strongly believe that at this point because we've met some of our best investors like that, the ones we've identified with the most who ended up funding us. We have an incredibly close relationship with today, which was we met them for advice. We didn't go into that meeting thinking these are people who are going to fund Automata. We went into that meeting thinking we want these people we respect, we want to have a conversation about what we're trying to do. And, you know, two out of three times in that situation the meeting kind of progressed and ended and then the follow-up meeting was about hey we believe in what you guys are trying to do uh, do you want to talk funding mm. and uh, i think we've built some of our best relationships in that investment circles and the limited ones we have in, in that in that in that format so do you think most founders because they're in such a rush to get funded and as you say you know they may be at rock bottom they need to move quickly they need to grow they sometimes approach those relationships in a bit more of a short-term instrumental way and actually taking more of a long-term 
approach to cultivating the relationship as it sounds like you did with your found with your investors mm -hmm. um, the ones that you built relationships with um, is more the way to go I would wholeheartedly uh, endorse the second mm -hmm. right which is go go with people who you believe uh, you know Syria and likes to put it like I can go to the pub with and um, actually some of our earliest investors uh, Wendy and Joe White after every funding round, you, you know, whether they were involved or not, we go out for a dinner uh, to celebrate. And um, they're the kind of relationships where you know you can call on mm. when things are going well or when things are not going well. And uh, that's really, uh, you know, for, for us, there was these key moments in the company. And I think all companies have them. Uh, where some of those key moments were major milestones that you've achieved and it's a pat on the back moment but there are those moments where it's sink or swim mm. and we've had both in Automata and we've turned to certain relationships in the investor community at, at both moments and we've gotten I think valuable feedback at both moments and uh, in, the one, in the sink or swim ones I would say support as well which is like you're going to get through this, you know, this is what you should watch out for. If not, this is how we're going to handle it. And for people like me and Suryanch, who were first time founders, that was invaluable because it, to a big extent, put your mind relatively at ease and you can just go back and face that problem mm. in, in, in its own context rather than having to worry about the constellation of things that come because of the ramifications of that problem. So Mustafa, tell me about one of those sink or swim moments that you just mentioned. Uh, what was the situation and how did you get out of it? Sure. So there's this moment that kind of uh, defined a whole year of the company for us. And it's a bit idiosyncratic, so I'll just give you a bit of context. Like um, what we're trying to do is design an affordable robot. And the crux of that is designing a new gearbox because the main performative component for a robot is its gearbox and the main line item in terms of its price is that gearbox. So uh, going into the business, this was a kind of uh, nexus of naivety, serendipity and happy accidents. We decided to design our own mm. and that would be a key differentiator for us. And <clears throat> I think going back, I would still make that decision. We would still make that decision to design our own gearbox, but it was rough. And we had to hire uh, great mechanical engineers. Uh, we couldn't have done it without that talent in the team. And, we, you know, the ethos me and Suryansh pushed within the company coming from a design background was make fast, break fast, right? Mm -hmm. The whole business was based on consumer 3D printing, right? Like, this is what we can do because we have 3D printers in the office. We don't have to operate at this normal prototyping timelines. And engineers come from a different spectrum, right? Uh, test, 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 uh, simulate, simulate, simulate. So I think we've reached a great happy medium as a company where we simulate and prototype. And I think that's why we move pretty fast as a company. But around March, April, there was this crisis, I would say, which was like, okay, we've exhausted a ton of our ideas. We have one or two that we believe are going to work and the prototypes were on the testing rig. So we decided to wrap this exercise up with what's called a lifetime test, mm -hmm. which is we're not going to go with blind faith. There's too much risk, uh, which is something we had to learn to do, which is when to hedge your bets or, and when to take the risk. And this, there's too much risk here. We need to take a pause and test this component. And even with accelerated testing, et cetera, et cetera, there was 30 days of that gearbox on that test rig. And if that gearbox broke any time before 30 days, we would have a major issue on our hands, which is we technologically cannot move forward. And mm. uh, therefore everything we've been doing, we, we had at, at that point built a great software team. Uh, at that point we had started to get a lot of market traction in terms of interest and we just needed the pro hardware to move forward. And, you know, in that in itself, that's a major challenge, man managing the cadence of a full stack software team and managing the cadence of a hardware team. And that was already a big challenge that we were dealing with, which is like telling the software, wait, 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 you're building your you're way ahead of the hardware team. We need to balance this out. But in the same time, there was this hard stop. 
we either pass or fail. Mm. And basically, that was one of those moments where we sat down, me and Suryansh, many times, just the two of us, us and, you know, some of those investors, we spoke to you about those relationships. And it's like, if it passes, this is what we're going to do. If mm. it fails, this is what we're going to need to do. Right. And there was no sugar coating it. Right. If, if it failed, certain things would have to change. The mm. cadence of the business would have to change. Um, the scaling process would have to change. So it, it was. I, at least I haven't faced a singular moment like that uh, since uh, we might have one again. But it was a moment where it literally came down to a single thing working and it wasn't a gradient of possibilities. It was pass or fail. Mm -hmm. And so there was no ambiguity. And it was just up to us as founders to decide how to handle that ambiguity, like that, that lack of ambiguity. If that happened, do this. If that happens, do this. There's no way around this. And, you know, at that point, we had done a lot of other things, which was parallelized multiple research streams into the gearbox. And we had basically, through survival of the fittest, narrowed it down to these few options. And, you know, thankfully it passed, right? Like, I, I very clearly remember the moment I woke up that day. We had it, we had it logging. The, 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 the gearbox would report to us over Slack. And waking up that morning, looking at my Slack, and it's like, okay, it didn't fail. You know, Jesus Christ, this is going to work. And, uh, you know, the, looking back on that, I think, again, you, you, just to say, like, what we would have done differently in our past, that moment should have been celebrated a lot more mm. because it was a big win for us. Uh, and I think at that time, me and Serenge were so mentally exhausted by it that we didn't celebrate it as much as we could because it was like such a terrifying moment for us. Mm. So have you now celebrated more wins as a oh, result yeah. of that experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so now, uh, as the consequence of that, uh, organizationally as a business, we've taken on testing a lot more seriously. Mm. So, you know, software companies are very familiar with the concept of, you know, test your code. Uh, hardware has different constraints. You have to test things over time mm. at statistically significant samples. Uh, so we, we've taken that a lot more seriously in the business. And uh, yeah, when, when new designs pass, uh, there's party poppers and everything inside, <laughs> inside the company. Uh, last year, luckily, one of them passed right a day before Christmas. <laughs> so that was nice. Nice way to, to celebrate it. Yeah, for sure. So talk to me about the hiring process. You have now grown to a company of, I believe, 20 people. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've obviously uh, hired some great people and hired some not so great people. W what's the one thing you've learned about hiring? Um, that's a really good question. I, I would say it would be really hard to put it down as one really good thing mm -hmm. I've heard, but uh, put some structure down to your hiring process. Mm -hmm. I can't say that enough to first-time founders or people starting to do this. Like, it's one of the main questions I get asked when I meet new EF cohorts or cohorts that just graduated from EF. Like, how do you hire once they're done fundraising, right? Because yeah. when you're fundraising, that's all you ask about. And I think what took us quite long to figure out was put some structure in place in your hiring process. It's going to help you a ton. In the early days, it was just me and Suryansh hiring for positions we've never experienced. Like, mm. how... How does an architect hire an electronics engineer? You know, how does an architect hire uh, a full stack developer? So that was a very interesting learning experience. And at that point, what really helped us was that gut feeling. Mm. And, you know, we hired for personalities we felt would fit the company, of course, who exhibited a high level of uh, technological competence and were clearly good at what they did. Mm. But we biased a lot more then than I think we do today maybe today it's 50-50, but because of our um, lack of knowledge in their specific expertise, we biased a lot to this is a person I could spend you know, 12 hours a day with in this small room. And luckily that got us 85% of the way there in terms of our hires of you know, really great people joining the team. Mm -hmm. And another thing that in those early days of hiring that helped us a lot was just seeing a lot of people, you know, uh, seeing... I think we saw at that point, like for a certain position, 50 candidates. And I know not everyone has that ability. Uh, we were lucky in certain roles because there's not a lot of interesting hardware uh, necessarily back then going on in London. Mm -hmm. So when a job like that opens up in central London, a lot of people apply. 
and that helped us uh, figure out who we wanted and what kind of profile we wanted because we saw just a ton of applicants and we took as many phone call and face-to-face -face interviews as we could to just like start to build our knowledge of okay this is what we want our mechanical engineer mm -hmm. to look like now when uh, we have a, a team in place the hiring process is significantly i would say different than in the days when it was me and suriansh putting out job ads and trying to figure out what we wanted now this is why i say put some structure in place because the team knows what they want to a big extent and they need to have a voice in that hiring process and if you leverage your team correctly you can uh, shorten that process quite a lot you can cull down your candidates quite a lot mm -hmm. and it's something we learned to do over time uh, and I think we're, we're still not there on that but we're getting better at it like leveraging your team and then the last part is no matter what sit down with that candidate right uh, I think we made a mistake a, a couple of times or you know we haven't hired that many people but uh, where that didn't happen mm. and the learning process there was just sit down with that person. Your, your team says, this is who we want. Technically, uh, we feel we could work with this person. They're great. And then you sit down with him or her. And um, again, it goes back to those early days where you're biasing for your, you know, your team has a big recommendation that covers 40, 50% of your decision. And then that last 40, 50% is like, do I feel this person is going to fit the culture correctly? Mm -hmm. uh, do I get a good read off of this person? Uh, does he or she respond well when I push her? So um, that's definitely helped us hire. Uh, the thing we struggle with right now, I would say, is the pipeline for our hiring. Uh, we're in a stage, thankfully, where more or less we're constantly hiring at this point of the company. And London is a very competitive ecosystem <laughs> for hires. Um, you know, we've been shocked at the roles that have been difficult to hire. Uh, you know, for example, uh, when looking for UX designers, we've mm -hmm. gotten a phenomenal response. Uh, I think people just see the opportunity of working in the UX field in robotics as something quite unique and the whole uh, question of human-machine interaction. There's not a lot of places you can do that work. Mm -hmm. um, it's full stack developers, we've had a lot of trouble. And we've been thinking a lot about this and dissecting it in the business like why is this happening we should be attractive on paper and uh you know two things we, we need to get our i think we need to get the work we're doing out there more so people people who are interested in this kind of work are seeing it you know just getting eyeballs on it and then the other part is i think it's a communications issue uh, a lot of people you know i would interview people and like why you know what did what was your initial impression? And I think the thing we weren't doing successfully and we can continue to do better is communicate that this is a more or less uh, standard web technologies role. Yes, you're in a robotics ecosystem and a product, but you don't need to come in and know the mathematics that drives the robot and the mathematics that does this and the mechanical. A lot of people had that fear. And I think if we, it's these tangential avenues that actually help you solve it. You can write in your job ad that I don't need you to know this. Mm -hmm. But there's in tangential avenues that actually help as well, like putting up a team page where an applicant can go up and look like, oh, you know, they've got that kinematics expert on board. They've got the mechanical engineering expert on board. They've got the product designer on board. So those two things click that I'm going to be there contributing to the web stack and at that point, hopefully, it becomes an exciting role for talented developers to want to join. So in, it's like get your structure in place, leverage your team, mm -hmm. and then to fill up your pipeline, communicate that role and your company correctly, I think has, has been key learnings for us in, in the hiring process. Mm, so obviously, in this interview, we've been speaking a lot about what you've learned as a company, you yeah. and Suryansh together. What have you most learned about yourself in this process of uh, becoming an entrepreneur and building Automata? Um, quite a lot, I would say. Uh, you know, I would, in my adult life, uh, I would say there were two or three relationships that made me learn the most about myself. Uh, one is my relationship with Automata. Uh, 
in all that it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, my co-founding relationship, my relationship with my team, and my relationship with my wife being the second one. Um, that is, those are both key opportunities for introspection. <laughs> and uh, but focusing on this one a bit more on automata, uh, yeah, you you have to learn a, a lot about um, how you handle things. Um, in the early days, it's self doubt. There's a lot of that, and I, I wasn't. You know, EF helped with this. Uh, regarding this question of who this is for, a lot of that was also about who we were as people mm. because you inherently look inwards or uh, have a, I, I think it's, I don't know what, what it is, it's some, it could be related to your educational background, but you sometimes you just don't believe very strongly in what you do all the time. And then being someone helping you through that and that relationship between you and your co-founder uh, or you and this ecosystem of EF helps you push through that quite strongly. Like, actually, yeah, I am doing meaningful, significant work people mm-hmm. are interested in, right? It's this, um, uh, I had someone explain it to me as tall weed syndrome, right? Which is the weed grows tall, it gets whacked, right? And it's similar, right? Like, who are you? You know, put your head down. Mm. So that was definitely something that I've had to learn about myself and something I'm still learning to do better. And the other one <coughs> is you know, a very open moment is that I know for a fact that in the past, and I'm improving on this, is I tend to avoid things like conflict, mm-hmm. right, as a personality. And that quickly gets put, pushed to the fore when you have a team, right? Like, and don't get me wrong, conflict is not uh, fisticuffs. Yeah. But it's just, I want to do this, I want to do that, or uh, my opinion is X, my opinion is Y. And having to handle that requires you to put yourself out there and say, I believe in this, mm-hmm. right? And, but in the same time, at least I strongly believe in, in, in the approach where you have to get both guys on board, or both team members on board, right? It's not, I'm choosing her, sorry, you're not going to go ahead. It's trying to bring those two together, but in the same time also knowing that you're going to have to at some point just vocalize your preference. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a process that team building really forces on you um, to to become stronger in that sense. And um, the other one is just like really being... Uh, clinical, clinically critical of what am I good at, what am I not good at. Mm-hmm. And the other part of that equation is what can I take that I'm not good at and feasibly improve? And what are the things I'm not good at and say, listen, I could improve on that, but as a return on investment, I'd, maybe it's better for me to focus on what I'm really good at and focus on the things that I can, in, in short and medium term goals, improve. Right? Uh, because, you know, maybe I can read about this topic or mm-hmm. practice that, that part. You know, we think of them, we talk, me and Suryan quite a lot about this, like, as muscles, right? Like, I need to practice this muscle, right? So, you know, feasibly I can practice this muscle a couple of days in the gym or a couple of months in the gym and I'm going to get good at it. So mm-hmm. that, that return on investment for the business is worth it and for me as a person is worth it versus I'm just going to accept that I'm not so good at this but I'm good at these other things, so I'm gonna, you know, train that. Mm. Awesome. Well, I think those are some great lessons to end on. Mustafa, thank you so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure. Sure, it was great. Thank you.